All right, number one, we're looking at Euler's polyhedra formula. And that tells us the number of vertices plus the number of faces minus the number of edges must equal two. And we can see here that the vertices plus the faces minus the edges equals two. And we're given two of these three variables to replace. So we can go ahead and do that. We have six vertices. We have no idea how many faces yet. That's what we're solving for. And then it has 12 edges and we need to know how many faces would it have? What value of F will make my left-hand side equal two? So we're gonna combine like terms here. This is going to be negative six plus F will have to equal two. And that just tells me to add six to both sides where F would equal eight. All right, so this is that one where I said we're going to have to use our imagination to help us. Um, and it's asking us to match each solid to the space figure formed by rotating about the axis of rotation. Let's talk about what it means by space figure. That's just another way to say polyhedron, which we know means three-dimensional shape, right? What we have to do is imagine if I were to spin this rectangle around this axis of rotation, what shape would it trace out? And I told you, if you have a hard time uh, using your mind to do stuff like this, what you want to do is pick one of the vertices that is not on the axis of rotation, and then go to the opposite side and imagine a point that's about the same distance. And then you're going to actually draw what would be the result of rotating this to that point and then back around. And we're going to do that again for the other vertex that is off, I'm gonna go around. And you see here, we're gonna have a very small cylinder. Remember, these lines I'm drawing here would be the height of that uh, polyhedra. And you can see here, we would have a cylinder. The number one thing not to fall for is when we're rotating these shapes, these sharp right angles are gonna become smooth curves because of the motion of the rotation around the axis. Now, if I'm taking the test tomorrow or when it's actually assigned or even five years from now, if you're still watching this video, this one isn't like this where it's right on the axis of symmetry or centered on the axis of rotation or symmetry. So I'm going to set this one aside for now and I'm going to move on to this one. And I'm going to use the process of elimination just to help me out. And this one is different than A because there's only one vertex that's off of the axis of rotation. So I'm gonna start with that and I'm gonna see just by determining this, what shape would I have here? Oh, that is a hemisphere. So C is going here. And then I'm gonna kind of imagine here what we can do. Now I know that's a poorly drawn hemisphere but you can see if you spin this around in your mind, it's so much easier in your mind than trying to draw these like we discussed in class. Just imagine what line this vertex would trace and then trace this back over the top. And you see you have a hemisphere, even though it is very crudely drawn. Now let's look at this last one. And the reason I said, let's wait a minute on this one is it's not, it doesn't have all of the polygon on one side or it's not cut right along the axis of symmetry of the polygon that we're rotating. So there might be, it might be easy to anticipate a very odd shape. But if we stick with this trick right here, just rotate it around to here. You can see I'm going to have a circular base and it's going to come to a point. And I can see that's a cone. And that means... Since the last option is a cone, I should feel pretty confident in all of my answers. All right, number three, a plane intersects the prism parallel to the base, which best describes the cross section. If you keep an eye on that scroll bar at the bottom there, you'll see eventually what it means to be a prism, but I'll go ahead and tell you as well. The prism means that the opposite faces or the opposite bases 
are the same. So here, this is base one at the bottom. And this is base two. So if those bases are congruent. So we're going to ask ourselves if a plane intersects the prism parallel to the base. So that means this line is going to come through. And it is parallel to the base itself. That's a little weird to draw a parallel line on the base, but now that we're looking at three dimensions, polygons kind of become our line in a sense. Um, because, the, well, exactly what a cross section is in two dimensions reduces it to a line. In three dimensions, a cross section reduces a polyhedron to two dimensions. So you get a polygon, and that's what it's asking us. What shape is that polygon at the base? Oh, to answer that question, I just need to know how many sides does my base have? Let's go to the bright blue. I have one, two, three, four, five, and an n-gon where n equals five is a pentagon. All right. All right, so now we're looking for the volume of a hemisphere. And as you can see on your screen there, my little scroller just happens to be lined up with what we need. If you had a chance to look at it, we had the volume of a sphere is equal to four pi r cubed divided by three. And then we had the volume of the hemisphere at two thirds pi r cubed. Now the way we get to that is actually a pretty common sense approach here. If I know that my sphere is a rotated circle and it has a volume of four thirds pi r cubed, if I were to only consider half of that, right from this plane that intersects right at the radius all the way around. If I only need to know how much I need to fill that top half, I would take this and divide it by two. And if you look at what four thirds divided by two is, that's the same as four thirds times one half. If you go back to some very basic algebra, and that's going to mean we're going to have four six, which simplifies to two thirds. So, Half of the volume of a sphere is the same as two thirds pi r cubed because if four thirds pi r cubed finds the whole thing, two thirds pi r cubed would find half of it. So with that knowledge, we can go ahead and use two thirds pi r cubed is equal to 281,000. 250 pi and it wants to know what is the radius and for that we're going to be thankful that they gave it to us in terms of pi so that we can do this much more easily my first thing i want to do typically is isolate my r but if i can get rid of an irrational number always 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 do that first and this is going to leave us with Two thirds r cubed is equal to two hundred eighty one thousand two hundred and fifty. Now we can do like we've been doing forever since pre algebra and start isolating our variable, multiply by the reciprocal. These will cancel. And then I'm going to do three times two hundred eighty one thousand. And then divide that by two. And that leaves me with r cubed on the left and 421,875. And since I know this ends in a five, I know when I take the cube root, I'm going to end up with a number that ends in five. But let's see what that is. Oh, that's a nice, nice number. So if I take the cube root, of both sides, I end up with R equals 
75. So this has a radius of 75. All right. A plane intersects the center of a sphere with a volume of about 9,202.8 meters cubed. What is the area of the cross section round to the nearest hint? So here, there's a lot of stuff going on here. First thing is, we have a sphere. And we know the volume of this sphere is 9,202.8. Right now, I'm going to leave the units off because we're going to be doing the math on it. And it wants to know what is the area. of the cross section. So basically, it's asking me right here, this little thing that I use to show the th third dimension, right, where we come in and out, it's also the cross section. So now we have to do, find a way to find the area. Well, what do I need to find the area of that cross section? We need the radius. So let's start with that. All right. So we know that the volume of a sphere is equal to four thirds pi r cubed. And we know that the volume of this sphere is 9,202.8. So we can set this up just like that. And just like we did a moment ago, first thing we want to do is start working towards isolating my R. So I'm going to multiply everything by what's in my denominator here. And you're going to see yet yeah, the way I'm doing it now is taking just an extra step. It's going to take a little bit longer. Last time I dealt with the four thirds at the same time by flipping the reciprocal and multiplying through. But I want to show you what we're doing step by step this time since this is how I've set it up. When I multiply this in, I'm going to end up with 9202.8 times 3, 27,000. Six hundred eight point four, and then when I multiply this in, it's just going to cancel my three, and that's going to leave me with is equal to four pi r cubed, which means my next move is to divide both sides by four. When I divide this by four, I get sixty nine oh two one point one is equal to pi r cubed. And now I can divide this by pi. Just gotta find the pi button on my calculator. There we go. So when I divide here by pi, I am left with 2197.006 is approximately r cubed. So if I take the third root of that, well, this is actually really nice to us in the way that they chose to present this. Let's go over here. This is going to be r is approximately, can't say equals anymore because we have rounded, 13.0000013. And our question says rounded to the nearest tenth, and there's no doubt about it. That R is going to be this. Now, we know in math, I say it all the time, that little last zero doesn't matter. 13.0 is 13, unless we're talking about density or we have significant digits involved here. So we're going to say R is approximately 13 for our answer. 
to the question, what is our radius for this circle? So now and say r is approximately 13 over here and now we need to find the area of the cross section so that means if i look at this circle my radius is 13 so my final answer oh i'm way above my view here this would be 13 here and then for my final answer let's make some room where's my eraser there we go make it huge Let's make it 100%. Well, R is 13. Here's my circle. This is my cross section, radius of 13. So I'm just going to do pi R squared. This is going to give me 169 pi. And I just got to multiply those through and round to the nearest tenth. So 169 times pi is 530.92. So my final, final answer for this part, this is a very uh, involved question, is 530.92. Nine. And of course, that's approximate. This is not an exact value because we have rounded at least twice during this problem. All right, for this one, we're not going to go into it too much. We've got Euler's formulas scrolling across the bottom right now as I speak. And I'm going to use version one. I prefer my variables all on the left. And I know that the three variables together, when I add the faces and the vertices and subtract the edges, need to come out to be two. So I'm not going to do all three of these. We're just going to do one of them. And then you can apply what I'm doing here to the rest of the problem here. We have eight faces, 10 vertices, and 14 edges. And we need to know, does that equal two? Or does 18 minus 14 equal two? No, it equals four. So this is a no. My left hand side and my right hand side were equal, we would be good to go. So let's change this one to six. And then you'll get an example of how this works when I would say yes. Now in green, I've changed it, that's why it's not an option here. But here I would have 16 minus 14, and that would no longer be four. That would be two, and since two equals two, this is a yes scenario. All right, for this one, we have a, assuming a soap bubble is a perfect sphere, what is the diameter of a bubble containing 1,200 cubic centimeters of air to the nearest tenth of a centimeter? So look at this here. They've asked us for the diameter for the first time, I think, on this test. And it's not a very common question, considering everything we do here is in terms of the radius, right? The volume of a sphere as we know it is 4 pi r cubed divided by 3. And now it's asking us for the diameter. And we know the diameter divided by 2 gives us the radius. So if we want to solve for the diameter, we're going to multiply by what's in our denominator there. And that's going to result in the diameter is equal to 2r and now we need to be able to solve for r and then make sure we're not falling for the trap of picking what looks to be here the radius versus the diameter for both of these if you look at a it's exactly half of what c is and if you look at b it's exactly half of what d is so what i'm going to assume since i like to try and look ahead and make sense and be prepared for answers to check mine against is I'm going to most likely be able to eliminate A and B as options since they're going to be the radius most likely. And it wants the answer in terms of the diameter. So I'm going to go ahead and start setting this up. I know that the volume of the sphere is 1200 cubic centimeters and the formula here for the volume itself is four pi R cubed over three. And I'm going to go ahead and jump straight in here and start solving for this. This time I'm going to do just three fourths, the reciprocal of this to clear it out. This is going to be 3,600 
divided by four. It's going to give me 900. This will be canceled when my divided by three or times three divided by four comes through and it's going to leave me with pi r cubed. Now I can divide both sides by pi. Because my goal here is to isolate r cubed. This is going to leave me with 900 over pi is equal to r cubed. And if I take the cube root of that, this is going to be 900 divided by, waiting for my phone to flip, pi equals 286.4788975654116. I do not want to do any rounding here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the cube root button. Oh, that's supposed to be a three, guys, not a check. And I am doing the cube root of 900 pi. And I'm doing this all in one step. And this is going to give me that my r is approximately 6.5922. And it wants me to round it to the nearest tenth. So I'm going to go ahead and do my multiply. Well, no. See, I almost fell right into their trap. I'm so used to doing everything in radius right now. But it wants it in terms of diameter. So I'm going to take this. 2r is equal to the diameter. So if I do 2 times this, 2r is equal to 13.18. And that rounded to the nearest tenth is exactly 13.2 and that right here i'm telling you the question here is we know you can do the volume of a sphere now what they're really wanting you to do is be able to differentiate and catch that difference here with the diameter and the radius relationship when i can find for the radius using the volume uh, equation i'm going to want to be able to turn that into the diameter from the radius since this is in terms of the radius all right, let's look at this one. This is our Cavalieri's principle here. What I've done is I've gone on and marked that cylinder A is a right cylinder, and that just means that the vertical that creates the wall of the cylinder meets the base at 90 degrees. And on B, we can see we don't have a 90 degree angle. But what we do have here are two cylinders with the same radius. and the same height. Remember that Cavalieri's principle tells us, even if this is not a right cylinder, if their heights are equal and the radii are equal, then the volumes are equal. I haven't even started reading my answer choices yet. I just wanna go over that here. So if I say radius A is equal to radius B and the height of cylinder A is equal to the height of cylinder B, then the volume of cylinder A is equal to the volume of cylinder B. And now let's look at what our options are. Option A, the volume of cylinder A is the same as the volume of cylinder B. All right, this isn't gonna be a long drawn out problem. Let's just show right here why these other ones don't work. There is not enough information to compare the volumes. Absolutely not true. This whole conditional right here is everything we need to prove through Cavalieri's principle that these are going to have the same. C, the volume of cylinder A is less than the volume of cylinder B. If you want a way to intuitively think about that, pretend this is a stack of coins. Let's say there's 10 of them here, right? So they have a height of 10 coins. Let's call them quarters. So it would make it easier to just throw that Q on there. I have a stack of 10 quarters stacked at a right angle going straight up. And then I have another stack of 10 quarters, or heck, I have the same 10 quarters. I've just kind of knocked them askew a little bit. Is there not the same exact amounts of metal in there to cast all 10 of those quarters? For sure. So we don't, we cannot say that that's true at all. And the volume of cylinder A is greater than the volume of cylinder B. 
that if that were possible, we'd all be able to never worry about precious metals or anything mining again. We could just stack up our metals, push them askew, straighten them up, and then keep generating more material. That makes absolutely no sense. And A is just the right answer. All right, the volume of prism A is 48. Let's go ahead and start recording this before we get too far into it. So the volume of prism A is 48. And the volume of prism B is half the volume of prism A. So basically, 48 divided by 2. So it is 24. What is the value of A? OK, so this is a really interesting one. This one's going to be fun. And I don't mean like difficult fun. I just mean like we actually get some time here to think about how this works. So if I want to find the volume of A, you'll see it scroll by eventually, but it's just, it's a prism, right? Opposite faces are the same. So this is just going to be length times width times height. And ultimately what we're trying to find here is the height of this one. So let's just call this X. Here I have a length of four, a width of three, and a height of X. And I know that the volume of A is 48. So here I have 12 times X equals 48. Divided by 12, X is equal to four. So for this one, I can come in here now and replace that with a four. Where are you at? Where's my eraser tool? Now I have a box that has a volume of 24. And I've done way too much work on this problem already. But like I said, it's a little bit more of a fun question. The volume of this box is 24. And I have length times width times we don't know the height yet. Here we have three times four times H is 24. This is 12 times H is 24. Divide both sides by 12 and H is a resounding two. Now on your review, it has multiple choices. And we can see that A would then be our correct answer. All right, so this one's got a lot going on and I've already you know, pre-read the question as I pasted it over. So we're gonna go step by step and just record all this information it's throwing at us in just the first sentence here before it even gets to the question. First thing it tells us, a stack of one dozen cookies. Well, how many cookies do we have in a dozen? That's 12. If it was a baker's dozen, it would be 13. This is another reason why I keep saying in class, geometry is a heavy reading and writing intensive class. So you need to know not only your math vocab, but just have a decent grasp on the English language to be able to break down these types of questions. Let's see. These dozen cookies have a diameter of five. And we know if we take the diameter divided by two, we get the radius. So the radius is two and a half. And it fits into a cylindrical container. Fits in is another word for volume. Cylindrical means it's a cylinder. And the volume of a cylinder is big B pi r squared times h. And what is the volume of this cylinder? It is 176.715. That point really didn't show up enough. All right. And now to throw everything together in like the craziest way possible, the question is, what is the thickness of one cookie? So we're going to have to deal with that. But before we do that, we need to know what is the height of the container? So let's start by solving for the height. This is going to be pi r squared h is equal to 176.715. And the first thing I can do to slowly 
solve for this is substitution. This is going to become pi 2.5 squared times h is equal to 176.715. I know 25 squared is 625. So this is going to become 6.25 h and i is equal to 176.715 and 176.715 divided by 6.25 right because we want to isolate our h is going to be pi h is equal to 28.2744. And then if I divide that by pi, I'm going to have my value for my height. Fairly nice number here. This is going to be 9.2744. Zero 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 two one zero. Stop writing equals when we approximate, right? We've rounded, so change that equals to approximately. So right now our cylinder has a height of, we're just going to say nine. Now with a height of nine and I have to get 12 cookies into that, Here's nine, but I have to get 12 cookies inside. I'm gonna do nine divided by 12, and that will give me 0.75 for my answer of my cookies thickness. And if you wanna check it, you're just gonna ask yourself 0.75 times 12, and that needs to equal, again, thinking ahead, 0.75 times 12, and that needs to equal the height. And that does in fact equal nine. All right, on our scroller right now, we have the volume of a square pyramid as L squared times H over three. Just wanna get that up there before it scrolls on by SP for square pyramid. Now this question is saying the height of a square pyramid. So that's what we're probably looking for is one half the length of each side. So the height is equal to the length divided by two. And the volume of this pyramid is 4,500 inches cubed. So I can replace this stand in for the volume of a square pyramid with 4,500. And then I have L squared and I'm gonna replace H with L over two. And that is over three. And I'm gonna start solving for this. Now there's two ways to do this. And I try not to interfere with you going into Algebra 2 next year and seeing different ways. But the more I sit here and think about this, and the more times I've had to re-record this one problem because I keep uh, kind of being in an internal conflict with myself and whether or not I want to show you it this way since I keep hinting at it. And I actually do it a lot in class. We just don't point it out to you as much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with it. And what I want to show you is remember this right here can be, well, this can be brought down as L over two. So this can be rewritten as L squared over three times L over two. And now if I multiply straight across, I end up with L cubed over six is equal to 4,500. And to me, this is just a much easier way to do it. And now I'm going to do, as I always do, multiply by what's in my denominator across the whole thing. These are going to cancel. And this is going to just tell me that L cubed is 27,000. And if I take the cube root of that, I'll find L. L is equal to 30. Now, the reason I like this way better is I was able to convert everything into terms of L 
do everything and get a nice clean number at the end with the side length of this pyramid being 30. This isn't my answer. This is just telling me that for my square pyramid, this is 30 and this is 30. This is my big B if I want to find the volume of this whole thing. What I'm going to be doing now is try and determine what is my height using the rest of the information given in the problem. Well, it says the height is one half of L, right? I have that over here. I did that to make this substitution. So all I have to do now to determine my height is put 30 over two and I get a height of 15. So my answer for this one is 15. Get in the habit here of just get really proficient with multiplying by fractions Understanding that we can do stuff like bring this L over 2 down and rewrite this as L squared times L over 2. And then with simple, make it even more simple by multiplying straight across. Otherwise, problems like this are really going to start catching you up. And developing this habit of mind is a really good way to become more efficient in problem solving in higher level math classes, you know, during your... Um, we start calling this the infancy of your intermediary math levels. Um, but yeah, it's just good practice of mind to be in that we can separate those fractions and do stuff like this. All right, what is the volume of the cone? Well, we know the volume of any polyhedron is big B times H. And when it comes to a point, it's one third or just big B times H over three. And that's what we're going to go with the big B over H times three. Here, big B is equal to pi r squared, since we have a circle for our base. So the volume of our cone is equal to pi r squared times the height over 3 to account for that point. Our radius and our height are given, so now we're just talking about a plug and chug and let's get it done situation. We're going to have pi times 5.1 squared times 7.2. 5.1 squared is not what I'm going to know off the top of my head, but it is 26.01 times 7.2. I'm going to go ahead and move the pi to the back end since we are multiplying and that is allowed. And now I'm just going to go straight across 26.01 times 7.2 times pi. And that leaves me with 588.332. And I can see here this would round to 588.33. All right, guys, we have an interesting question here. You ask, when are we going to use this in real life? This is it right here. If your boss watches every penny that moves around, if you are packing or if you start your own business and you're packing and your margins of profit are really cheap, so you need to monitor your inventory with every ounce of scrutiny you can muster, this is the type of problem that you want to be able to understand. It says a basketball with a diameter of 9.5 nothing we do is in diameter so let's go ahead and figure out what the radius is if i divide that by two i get 4.75 let me double check yep it's placed in a cubic box so already i missed a key thing here right it's going to be asking me for the volume of this sphere or this basketball so let me put that formula up And then it says a cubic box. So we're talking about the volume. I'm saying sphere again because I'm just looking at what I wrote of a cube. Well, the volume of a cube is just length cubed. And that has 10 inch long size. We'll get to that once we figure out what we're actually trying to answer here. How many cubic inches of packing foam are needed to fill the rest of the box? So yeah, packing foam is what you're using to protect the ball. Let's draw a cross section of that just so we can see what's going on here. Here's a cross section of my box. I'm going to drop a basketball in there. And according to this problem, 
we need to fill this with foam to what I can only assume would be to protect the ball from bouncing around. But what's the point of a basketball if it's not to just bounce it around, right? So it says, how many cubic inches of packing foam are we going to be needing? Well, that really white, blue, gray color is our packing foam that we're filling in there. So to figure out how much of that we need, what we'll do is the volume of our box, call it the volume of C, minus the volume of the basketball will tell us how much empty space we need for the volume of our packing material, right? So now we can come in here and say that L cubed minus 4 pi R cubed over 3 is going to give us the volume of our packing material that we need. This is what I mean by, you know, saving money. If you have to cut this foam ahead of time and you have some scraps lying around and you see that you have enough by volume to re reuse it before you have to toss it and take a loss on that material, you can do that starting today with this information. So here, the length of the side of the box is 10. So that's going to be 10 cubed minus 4 times pi times, and don't do this, 9.5, that's the diameter. Make sure we have the radius in there, 4.75 cubed over 3. This is going to be 1,000 minus, and I'm going to do this one on the calculator, 4.75 cubed is 107.17 craziness. I'm going to multiply that by 4. Now I have 428 point something. Multiply that by pi. Now I have 1346.76. And divided by 3 is approximately 448.9. Let me just double check. It says to the nearest tenth. So what I'm going to do, and this is a way that we can use an approximate value, but still end up with a solid approximation right without a rounding error here instead of just stopping at and rounding to the nearest tenth when i subtract i'm going to go at least two extra place digits out place values out two zero five i went ahead and went three when i do this subtraction it's going to leave me with enough of this information that this is not going to sway my approximation at the end and i'll be able to use it so i'm going to take that 1000 minus that number and it leaves me with five, five, one, zero, seven, nine. I didn't, I'll be honest, off camera here, I didn't actually put in 44.90025. So let me do that just so you aren't saying how in the world did you do that or doubt. 9025. Okay, so I should just go out one more place, 795. And that's going to tell me. How much packing foam I need. But see, here is the nice thing. Because I went so much further out, right? It says to the nearest tenth. I can see now that that's going to round to 551.1. And these two extra place values are not interfering with the accuracy of my rounding here at the end. So my final answer here is this. And you notice I overextended my box because I didn't include my units. This is 551 inches cubed for this packing material.